Thanks for allowing us to come in and intrude on you and have this conversation. I've been looking forward to this ever since our phone conversations. Yeah. It's really delightful. And, uh, so it's a pleasure to talk with you, and thanks for letting us come. My pleasure. I'm glad you're interested in this topic, and I'm glad that you know who else to talk to about it, because I often feel as if I have no company in my concern about kids learning to read and spell and their appreciation of their language. And um, my daily work is teaching teachers about how to teach reading. And what astonishes me, even though I've been at this for more than 30 years, what astonishes me is just the not widespread is is too is too benign a word. It's it is um, the ignorance in our culture of the structure of language and how children learn it, and because of that ignorance, it's so challenging to teach people the mechanics of reading instruction when they have no insight into what the challenge for the learner really is. And uh, just, you know, day in and day out, we're videotaping a whole series of lessons for teachers on how to teach reading and trying to capture in short moments what the instructional routines are. And in putting this together, um, I found once again, working with the teacher models who are all chosen for their um, putative skill in teaching, how wide the gaps are in their own knowledge base and how much they, in spite of being generally good teachers, how much they miss the teachable moment with children because of their lack of insight into what transpires if a child miscalls a word or misses something in spelling. And because of the knowledge base that's lacking and the insight that's lacking on the teacher's part, for which I do not fault them, by the way, um, I can't fault them for what nobody taught them, for what our culture doesn't appreciate. But I see the current problems with literacy in this society as so rooted in um, the inability of teachers to reach kids where where the conceptual development needs to take place, that um, uh, it just seems like a huge and overwhelming problem unless our, our society as a whole develops more insight into what's really happening and embeds that into teacher education somehow, which is not happening at the moment. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> you just about said that. All right, I mean, you know, that's my, that's, that's really what, what I have to say about all this. Well, uh, that's what's dominating us, is that we okay. agree with you completely. And that, uh, you know, there's so many places for teachers to, uh, I mean, there are certainly teachers that care and that are open and interested in pulling themselves into learning this. And I get a lot of mail, a lot of calls that are basically down to, I'm this isolated lone ranger in my school district or my, mm -hmm county office or in the psychology department or in the reading instruction area or in my particular school mm -hmm. and n nobody wants to hear. They're, they're blocked off. They, they're, um, um, these people feel like they're, they're all alone pushing a big boulder up the hill and they're mm -hmm. wondering what can we do to mm -hmm. help open this up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the, the ability to, to speak to the community at large and the, with the teachers and bring a battery of a range of expertise to bear. So it's nobody's, it's nobody's business angle, it's nobody's political angle, it's nobody's, it's all these things collectively saying, we need a fundamental reframe in how we think about all of this as the backdrop from which to move into parenting and teaching and all of the things that are, that are necessary. And uh, so we join you completely. Before we go on, Louisa, could you just kind of, have to just, okay. that's fine. I just had a little shadow on your eye. Right. Thanks. All right. So that's a great start. Um, if you don't mind, I know we talked about this in the phone, but maybe a, a three to five minute, your comfort level, you know, history, background, 
how you come to this. It's one of the most important things, for, especially when we talk about sharing this, not necessarily in the broadcast, but other ways in the web and whatever. People want to get to know mm -hmm. more about the people that are the champions, the drivers, the changes, which I certainly consider you one in that group of that are changing all of this. So understanding where people are coming from, what's motivating them, is a helpful backdrop to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, how is it that you found your way in your life adventure to being this champion of change in the mm -hmm. learning to read field? Mm -hmm. uh, how did it touch you when, when you come here? Well, I came into this field by accident and I came by my insights into the structure of language and how kids learn to read, uh, sort of backing into it. I started out as um, a technician in a neuropsychology laboratory after being a music major in college. And in the neuropsychology laboratory, which was the first one established in Boston in 1966, I started out giving tests to people with brain injury and um, seeing children who were referred for learning disorders. And after giving a five-hour battery of neuropsychological tests to these kids, um, which I was taught to do as, as kind of a rote technician, I kept thinking to myself as a young woman that I was not learning what we ought to be learning about the problems of children. And I remember a child going through a lengthy test battery, very expensive, and at the end of it all, um, we had no insight into why the child had such severe writing problems. There were no outcomes on these um, neuropsychological tests that explained what was going on with the child. And that was a, a stunning experience for me because I realized that there was so much we weren't looking at or weren't understanding. And then I became a special ed teacher. Through that licensing process, I realized that I wasn't being taught things that made sense. I went on to be a teacher. I realized mainly that I didn't know how to help the children with reading problems that I was bumbling along uh, without the requisite insights. I was equipped with um, poor theories that had very um, little explanatory value. And I went on through about 10 years of teaching, uh, learning to give tests and so on. And then finally, I, through the back door, entered a doctoral program in reading at Harvard. I was fortunate that they took me. I really didn't know what I was getting into. And I began to study language with Carol Chomsky. And in the process of that course, my whole view changed. I realized that um, there was a framework of understanding, a framework for looking at kids' behavior with the symbol system that um, that was linguistic, a, a linguistic perspective that began to give me real explanations for why kids misspelled words in certain ways, why our alphabetic code was difficult. And I began to get a grip on the role of phonology in learning to read. Um, however, I have to say at the end of of um, my five years in the doctoral program, I had done a dissertation on spelling. Uh, and my dissertation, uh, which was published for anyone who's interested, was on the interpretation of spelling errors in dyslexic children. And I basically came up with the finding that other people had come up with that the qualitative nature of the spelling errors in dyslexic kids was was not different from normally progressing kids, except that they were unable to transcend certain hurdles of symbolization and get past certain challenges in the speech-to-print relationship. And that's all that I really could say about it. But at the end of that process, Carol Chomsky looked at me and she said, Louisa, shaking her head, she said, I still don't think you know what a phoneme is. <laughs> and I said, can I graduate anyway? And she said, Yes, but I want you to continue your study because you need more insight into what's really going on. So I did continue my study because I became a clinician. I became a clinician instead of a professor because um, I married someone who wanted to live in rural Vermont and there was no place to be a professor. So I got licensed as a psychologist and I then was a clinician for about 15 years. And I continued my, 
my study of reading and language and writing problems. And through the intimate experience of two to three thousand clients of all ages uh, who, who came in with a pretty consistent presentation of, you know, I find this challenging, or, or a, an adult who would come in and say, I never learned how to read. Um, I, I had to piece together for myself what the challenging mechanisms were. And of course I had to read a lot and go to conferences and then I was continuing to do research. Um, Reed Lyon was a, a key person in my experience at that point because he was working in Vermont and as he got his role at the NICHD he kept pulling me into conferences and, and asking me to write chapters for books and so on. So I continued my research and continued publishing even though I was a clinician. Um, so I would say those were the formative experiences for me. And then getting into the political arena and the national uh, scene uh, only happened for me around 1996 when I got the job working on the California Reading Initiative. Um, was ready to leave Vermont, personal changes. And uh, uh, then I, I I, I really didn't know until I got to California and the big reading wars were taking place. I didn't understand what other people didn't know. I didn't understand when I, until I was in a room full of reading professors and I was asked to explain to them what the reading initiative was about. I didn't understand this enormous gulf of perspective that existed between me and them and why they were so affronted by the changes brought on by the California Reading Initiative, which was really a, a kind of precursor for Reading First and uh, the National Reading Initiative. So I, I, um, I guess I would say that my experience all along, um, no matter what, what role I've been in, is um, the realization of this lack of insight that people have. And then all, all throughout I've been teaching teachers. I've been teaching teachers in small venues and in a well, summer institute I've run for years in Vermont and small colleges. And, um, and now on a much bigger scale I'm teaching the teacher leaders in many states who are carrying out Reading First and they through my letters program, the Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. I'm trying to put in, in a workable format this knowledge base that's been so critical for my own development as a clinician and as a teacher. And tr I'm trying to educate other people. So I go around to other states and work with the, the leaders in the reading initiatives. We do the institutes on um, what it means to learn to read, the role of phonology, what a speech sound is, how the speech sound system is organized, how, how the orthography is mapped onto the speech sound system, uh, a little bit on the history of orthography, the historical layers in the orth orthography, and what astounds me, it continues to astound me, that the people who are in the leaders have no background. They don't know anything. <laughs> about the structure of the orthography, how it came to be that way. I mean, most basic things like the recognition of a Latin root, um, the recognition of a prefix and that it's not just a syllable, it's a meaningful part that's represented in the orthography in a stable way. This is a foreign concept. The idea of um, uh, syllable spelling patterns totally new idea. Um, the idea that a grapheme is not a letter. A grapheme is what represents a phoneme. And of course there's no insight into that unless there's insight into what the phoneme system is. And nobody's ever taught that to them. When we get through these institutes because there's so much new information, people on the one hand are grateful and wonderful and receptive. And on the other hand, they're exhausted and overwhelmed because I'm trying to teach them a knowledge base 
that I've acquired after years and years of experience and gradual haphazard learning, except for Carol Chomsky's course. Um, so I appreciate how um, they react, which is, we can't learn all this in a day. We need much more. Um, and they also go through a process of grieving for all of the misconceptions and uh, sch schemas that they have been taught and have tried to live with as teacher educators that they know on some level have not served them very well, but that's all they've had. So they've had often a huge financial investment, often a huge emotional investment, in theoretical models that really don't make sense, that have not served us well, that have not made a dent in the huge problem of illiteracy in the United States. Um, so they're also going through having to abandon dearly he held belief systems that on the one hand, they don't really want to swear allegiance to, but on the other hand, um, they have been very invested in. So it's like anything, you know, people get invested in bad ideas, bad relationships, um, bad financial investments, and, and it, it's hard to say goodbye to them. And it takes much more than a day. So I, I find that as I go out and do this, I rarely now find any hostility toward the ideas or toward me. Um, it's only people who don't know my work who, uh, who, who get up in front of conferences and say nasty things about me. I, I don't find that. We get evaluations from the people we teach and they almost universally say, thank you so much for these insights. But, but then they say, well, we need you know, weeks more to really learn this. And, and then, uh, then we go back to the whole issue of the fact that they went through their licensing, they went through uh, the certification, they went through graduate degrees without ever being taught what they need to know. And I had an experience yesterday. Um, stop me if I, sh if I shouldn't just ramble, but okay. So I had this experience yesterday that, that I've been thinking about, in fact, in the middle of the night. We're working with a, a, a teacher leader from the city near here who is in charge of teaching other teachers. And I asked her whether they had a Reading First money, so whether they were working with the Reading First program. She said, well, you know, the city school system tweaked their grant so that it, it, it would fit what we're already doing here. She said, the teachers here don't do phonics because the teachers don't know the information. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's exactly the issue. The teachers don't know the information, but the solution is not, not teaching phonics. The solution here is supposed to be teaching people how to teach phonics, but on the other hand, I'm thinking to myself, it's not teaching teachers the phonics of old because the way phonics is usually taught is, is, is not what I'm talking about. So on the one hand, you don't want to think, well, I understand your alienation and that teachers don't know it. On the other hand, the, the solution is not going on with reading instruction that's totally devoid of any meaningful instruction about the structure of language. But yet that's what's happening in this city and no one is doing anything about it. <laughs> that, that, that's, this is, this is a, uh, connected to what I was saying before about how much frustration there, are, there is in the education community because the people that start to get a glimpse of this are now you know, pushing this new boulder that they've acquired up the hill in all these other places that don't yet understand it, and they're not as well equipped as you are to get enough of this insight across to inspire the appetite that's necessary to pull the boulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully that's, I mean, that's part of what we want to do too, is to, is to get out there in such a way that, that 
they're not dismissed because for political reasons, they're not dismissed, you know, that it, that, mm -hmm. that it snowballs and that people, um, people get enough of a sense of the history of this, enough of the sense of the unnaturalness of the challenge, enough of this that uh, it opens them and pulls information into them because they have an appetite for it rather than pushing at them and that that pulls the kind of work that you're doing and others are doing in different ways and different pieces um, to them. That mm -hmm. They want to pull it in. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they now become more and more hungry for it. Um, well, we, you know, uh, we've really worked on the strategies um, for reaching beyond the prejudices and um, barriers, the conceptual barriers people have. And I, I think if there's anything I have to offer to this mission, it's that we found some approaches that are powerful in, in engendering insight into these uh, motivated adults. They're motivated by the mission. They, they do want children to learn to read. And that is their life's work. Um, so the, the strategies, um, I, I think I'd like, to, I'd like to talk some about those strategies because I think they're different from what other people do. Um, the strategies that we use in these institutes are quite different from what goes on in standard professional development. And the one thing we found we have to do in order to get at the um, uh, understandings people need about orthography is to start with phonology. And what I say to the learners, my goal is to have your phonological processor and your orthographic processor get a divorce in the next two days because you as a proficient reader have amalgamated your appreciation of the speech sound system of English and your appreciation of the letters and the print system that represents spoken language to such an extent that you no longer appreciate the difference between a speech sound or a phoneme and how we represent that in print. It is an impediment to be a proficient reader to have this insight, and yet for a child to learn to read, a child has to come by insights that you at one point had to come by as a novice reader. So, so in other words, what you're saying is that the, the degree of transparency, because this is all in, invisible to you, then it's hard for you in, in the teaching of reading to really see the challenges that are there in a way that's remotely like the child that's struggling to read. And so you, because you lack that connection to the challenge, how can you meet them? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, we're in total track there. That's yes. One of the things we're very interested in is that exact point. Yes. How do we make once again, would you go ahead, the, um, I'm not in anything, so she, whenever I'm talking, she can do whatever I'm talking. Um, how do we make the challenges that the adults see, or the coach sees, or the parent, or the teacher, whoever's helping, how do we make those as vivid and obvious to them as it is to the child, uh -huh. so that at, when they're when they're coaching, when they're when they're trying to help, they're they're actually able to track with these fluctuations, these articulations, stutters, these hesitations, and so forth, and see their correspondence with the orthography. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, our start point is asking people to count speech sounds and asking people to identify the speech sounds in words. And we start out, well, well, first we give people a theoretical model that we come back to over and over again. At first it doesn't make any sense to them, but then we work at the pieces. That theoretical model uh, is the four-part processing model that was in the latest Seidenberg um, article in, in the American Psychological Society uh, publication. It was also in Marilyn Adams's book as a kind of organizing device. We found that's a really great organizing device. So we say to people, um, 
look, uh, what has to happen is your phonological processor, your orthographic processor, your meaning processor, and your context processor all have to work in concert to identify the written word. But for you to appreciate what the child has to learn and what we have to do to educate all of these processors, we're going to chip away at, 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 at separating them so that you have a clear idea of what the job of each of these processing systems is. So we start with the phonological processor and I ask the audience to count the number of speech sounds in the words that I say. And I do it, I do it as a group activity because my goal is to have them see that even with the simplest words that there's disagreement in the audience. So I say, um, how many speech sounds in the word though? And of course there are two, but I get people counting Sometimes one, they just count the syllable, they count more than two. Or I'll ask them, how many in once? And that's a good word because the orthography doesn't match the speech sounds in a transparent way. Or I'll say, what's the first speech sound in the word once? And the, they're, you know, they're, they're challenged by that. They can't pick out the w because there's no spelling for it. Or I'll say, what's the first speech sound in uh, use? And it's the glide, y, you know, it's the glided U, but they'll say, well, it's long U. I say, what's the, what's the first sound? The dog has to scratch. I think, you know what, the, the, guy, the guys are out in the back working, and I think because she's having the itchies, maybe I ought to just put her out in the yard because they're easily confused by their orthographic images of words and that they are coding words as, in their own minds, as sequences of letters and that the covert process of uh, mapping those letters to sounds is something they're no longer aware of and that it's going to take some um, effort to um, become aware again. Were they aware of words uh, at one point? I or, or, or did they yeah. breeze by this without having to make explicit uh, distinctions in order to develop the facility they have? Um, many, many of uh, our adult learners, the teachers, report never having been phonemically aware. Uh, however, they must have been aware to the extent that they could learn to read adequately. However, of course, when you dig a little deeper with those learners, um, it's easy to find areas in which their lack of complete phonemic awareness trips them up as far as remembering spelling words or remembering pronunciations of words or remembering the differences between words that sound similar. So they do in fact make phonological confusions. They're just not debilitating ones. Right, which, which yeah. some, you might, some might argue, I wouldn't, but that here they are teachers. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with this all the time. And in some respects, what you could hope for was is that the you know, the kids that are in the below proficient and further down and below basic and so forth would be as good as they are. And they're this good without having gone through this explicit um, analytical instruction. Uh, there is an argument often made to me that the threshold of adequate phonemic awareness and linguistic awareness is much lower than I would have it, ideally. Uh, because um, my, maybe my critics or detractors or those who, who argue against the kind of professional development I'm in favor of say that kids can learn to read if they're only partially phonemically aware and they only need so much to get on with the self-teaching process and to, to form word recognition habits. However, the, the other side, the, my um, my response to that is that, oh, that sounds like, that sounds like Bob working out here on, on the system. I think differences can really be explored in this program. If you can get to the heart of what the issues are and really demonstrate what's what. And that's what we really hope. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, you can tell by the diversity of the mm -hmm. people that we're talking to as we're learning our way of mm -hmm. understanding the, the various perspectives. Mm -hmm. um,
Yeah, Did you find him, yeah. David? Did you no, find him? No, I did not. There's oh. a ladder out here in the vegetation. Um, so on the issue of whether the code is overrated, is that where we should pick up? No, I think we should go back to where we were. And you're drawing out the counter argument to those that think the explicit teaching or your particular approach to training teachers mm -hmm. related to kind of developing a more explicit awareness of the structure mm -hmm. of language, how relevant mm -hmm. and important that is mm -hmm. um, in the face of those that might say, gee, I learned without all of that. And mm -hmm. I'm a teacher, I'm a professor. Mm -hmm. So why should we mm -hmm. go through all of that and, and mm -hmm. drill our kids through all of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are people who've learned how to read without explicitly um, knowing the structure of language. But um, it, it's not a satisfactory argument when their responsibility is to teach children how to read. That necessitates explicit uh, teaching of the relationship between speech and print. Otherwise, okay. Well, that's a little circular because they're okay. saying, well, it wasn't for right. me and here right. I am. Okay. Well, it's true that there is a continuum of proficiency, probably genetically influenced um, and experientially influenced, but there's a continuum of proficiency in uh, the degree to which any of us are uh, aware of the speech sound structure of our own language and aware of the speech to print map. So we have people who figure it out. I have case studies of four-year-olds who are able to segment any word you give them into a sequence of phonemes. Uh, they have learned from seeing print and they've learned from some incidental feedback but mainly they have a great ear for the structure of spoken language and they can intuit on the basis of very little instruction what the speech to print map is all about. It delights them. These are the kids who end up being uh, national spelling bee champs and they sort of have it all down. Um, they enjoy language analysis. And then we have um, a great middle range of kids who manage to learn to read adequately even with rather incidental and um, uh, inexpert instruction. And data show quite clearly, I think, that if the overall classroom program includes going through phonemic awareness exercises and phonics instruction, that those children will be better off. They'll learn to read faster and more proficiently, and that early start will give them a leg up on reading fluency and comprehension for the duration. And then we have a proportion of kids, and that estimate uh, of the size of that proportion varies according to the context, but it's anywhere from 20% in Scarsdale to 80% in the Arizona Reading First Schools um, and everything in between of kids who are not learning to read naturally from exposure. And a good 40% of those kids require rather expert instruction in order to defy the odds, in order to overcome their, un, their, their lack of natural affinity for linguistic analysis. And I'm using that term linguistic analysis for, uh, for a lot of things, but it's mainly for insight into phonology, insight into orthography, insight into morphology, and all those interrelationships between the structure of words and the meaning of words. And those things are related. So what I see in the teachers who are, are defended against what I'm saying is that they do well with say the 60% of kids who are sort of going to learn to read if they get any kind of uh, systematic exposure and practice. So there's some structure in the approach. And then at least 40% of the kids are going to remain below benchmark, are going to remain inept, uh, are going to be those kids, the sizable group of kids who are at risk for reading failure and the further you go on the continuum of linguistic proficiency in, in the child population, the more dependent they are on the ability of the teacher to explain 
in detail what is happening when words have to be recognized in this alphabetic code. And then um, spelling. I mean, who cares about it anymore? I do. What our data are showing is that we, and in our Washington, D.C., Houston project, which went on for four years, through a lot of hard work, we were able to bring the children up to the national average. It's high-risk population. They showed significant gains in reading, but their spelling and writing and mastery of the code for written expression was abominable. It's, that's where the educational disaster is now. And we're very concerned about the lack of direct instruction uh, for the children. And our, our observational data show that the children were not being taught writing, but they were not being taught the symbolic aspect of getting the words on the page. And as we know from Ginger Bringer's work and other sites, we know that if the children aren't taught the symbolic code for, for transcription, that will affect their ability to compose at higher levels. So, so in other words, the, 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 the better their differentiation about the structure and the learning to read process, the more that that informs their uh, ability to write and spell. Oh, absolutely. There's an analogy in written expression that uh, it's direct to, to reading, which is that now I think people accept that automaticity with the code, accuracy and automaticity, or accuracy and fluency with the code, enables comprehension. And people now are beginning to appreciate why that's the case. So I think we've made a dent in the awareness of educators. Processing efficiency, and bandwidth drag, comprehension. Yes. yes. Right. But the same thing is true for writing, and that's an underappreciated fact. So what we have in classrooms now is at least deference to the need to teach phonological skills and decoding in a systematic way. And then uh, 20 minutes later, they're teaching writing through whole language, sort of, uh, uh, how would I describe this, um, uh, through, through, through an approach that values the expressive intent of the child and the importance of the child's voice and communicative intent with very little skill development and very little appreciation of what it takes to teach the child to spell, uh, to uh, form letters, to know one letter from another, to develop handwriting fluency, to use punctuation as a sim symbol system for linguistic expression and prosody. Uh, and for syntactic um, uh, 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 well, the syntactic um, uh, um, classifications that have to go on. I mean, you don't use an ex ex exclamation point unless you're using a certain type of syntax and so on. Uh, commas have a function in the structure of a sentence. These are things that are not taught in a, a planful, systematic way. So, or, or, or how you put a clause on a sentence, or um, what the function, wh where we see the biggest deficits in our population now in the writing study that we're doing, is they, the children cannot put inflections on the ends of written words. They don't identify the existence of plurals, past tense, uh, and verb markers uh, in order to transcribe spoken words into print. And what's the problem there? It's phonological, it's morpho morphophonological, and it's orthographic. And these are all layers of, of linguistic analysis that the children are very naive about. And if you start at the fourth grade level trying to get kids to put endings on words, it's much, much too late. It simply is not going to take. This kind of, we, <clears throat> clearly, the writing and spelling is different than the reading in mm -hmm. terms of the time that the brain has to participate volitionally in the expression. Yes. yes. Right? One's happening right. in fractions of you know 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. The other one, if it takes me a couple of seconds to figure out how to spell something, yeah. it's not a big deal. It takes me a couple of seconds to process the reading level. I'm done. It's, done. Yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. So there's that distinction. But otherwise, 
what, what I'm hearing you say, which is really powerful, and I agree with you, it's just radically missed. It's something that we're unconscious of in education generally, mm -hmm. is that this uh, awareness of the, of the structure, helping children, the deeper that kids differentiate their way into the structure, the more that that's going to radiate through all code-related processes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I can give you an example uh, um, about what I mean by depth of linguistic analysis on the part of the child that's necessary for proficient reading and spelling. Before we go oh, there, let's okay. make a distinction between um, the kind of insight that comes at the edge of a uh, of, of differentiation, listening to a difference, um, uh, recognizing the amorphic pattern visually, mm -hmm. Um, that and analysis where there's a self-reflective observer thinking okay. about it that's coming to it because okay. I understand how um, you know for example the children that are, are better able to take off are better able to take off because they've made differentiations distinctions in sound because of the complexity and rate of the oral language environment they're growing up in that have uh, developed a greater level of phonemic distinction sound mm -hmm. distinctions that they're able to stand on as they move forward with, mm -hmm. but they haven't done that analytically in the sense that they're thinking about, gee, that's not different than this. Mm -hmm. They've done it. They've different. They've done it through an extended differentiation mm -hmm. of the listening process, mm -hmm. which involves brain here and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when you say linguistic analysis, are you referring to a pr pr a practice that would be, you know, self-aware, volitional, analytical, uh, mm -hmm. uh, objective in that way, or or are you referring to a process of this differentiation extension, or both? Okay, I'm thinking that the instructional process ought to emphasize conscious analysis of what is in a word at several levels as a beginning step, and that leads to a much more automatic process of word recognition and differentiation of similar word tokens in the language. So if, for example, you want a second grade child to automatically and without effort recognize the difference between glass and grasp, or sorry, glass and grass, or as we saw yesterday in our videotaping, grasp and gasp. Uh, because the children were reading a story and both those words were in there, gasp and grasp. And it turned out that they didn't really know the meanings of either one. So um, uh, what was happening for the children was that they were not, uh, at any analytical level, identifying what was different, G grasp and gasp. And they were having trouble. I, I asked the teacher to ask the children if they could tell her what was different about those two words. And they could look at the words and they could analyze them by sound. Um, and the children were slow and hesitant. And these are children who are in need of direct teaching in order to learn how to do this. So when we got the children into a skill session, we then had them uh, build words from the inside out. And we had them change rasp to grasp. And we had them change uh, glass to grass. Because we wanted them to be able to say that it's the second sound in the word that is different, and that's represented by either the presence of a letter or the absence of a letter or the presence of a, of a specific letter. But inside of a blend, uh, those, those phonemic and orthographic elements are elusive. They're elusive because in the co-articulated word that a proficient reader will process automatically, um, that second sound is, is co-articulated with the first sound and then uh, into the vowel so that if you say grass, um, you, you're not necessarily thinking explicitly about the er that's in there. But in order to get a child to recognize that for the purpose of differentiating these words when they see them in print and then knowing what the meanings are and attaching the right meaning to the right word form, they have to become analytical about it. And it was so interesting in the instruction, the kids were 
were slow and hesitant. And then the teacher kept saying, well, what's the first sound in grasp? And the kids were saying, gr, gr, as if the first two sounds were one sound. And that's the problem. They've, they in their own minds have not taken the word apart enough to know consciously what the difference is. Those children were showing us that they were making errors on those words, both for reading and spelling, until they had been walked through the analytical process. So my view is that the teacher ought to know enough about the source of an error like that and ought to be able to walk them through explicit analysis uh, so that uh, the children see the, the GR when they're reading the word as two speech sounds that are blended together in the co-articulated word, but that doesn't mean they're one sound. So backing up from that, it's necessary conceptually to have the children understand that there's such a thing as a digraph, you know, a two-letter combination that represents one sound, and such a thing as a blend where the two letters represent two distinct spe speech sounds. Um, that, so that's part of the instruction. And it's a part of a sequence of concepts that are built very deliberately and uh, planned practice with words that differ from each other only in one speech sound or in one grapheme. So fluency exercises are built in there to have kids read words like gasp, grasp, grass, glass, uh, to uh, make sure that when they get to the point of automaticity, that the automatic recognition process is founded on uh, a differentiated image of each of those words. Uh, because without that, you, because there's a relationship between that and knowing the meanings having then an automatic pathway between the whole word and the meaning. Good. Um, let's go to the meaning for a minute. Okay. In, in the example that you're talking about, I mean, uh, if you were to do it on a, on a scope or break down time, you'd see that the difference between grasp and grass, it, 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 the, the, the amount of time that it takes to make that difference as I'm listening to it is a tenth of a second, two tenths yeah. of a second, it's really fast, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So that's one issue. Is the, is, is, do they have the... Uh, you know, phonemic distinction, frequency rates, and all of the things that it takes to recognize that difference if they heard it, one. Yeah. And then secondly, you've got, if they've never heard the word before, is the meaning of the word, if they've never encountered the meaning of the word, is the meaning of the word self-evident from getting it pronounced right in their mind? Well, the meaning won't be self-evident. That's part, and then, so good instruction, it does not compartmentalize these insights. I mean, what, one of the problems we have now in talking about five components of reading instruction is that the teachers teach them as if they were separate. Discrete mechanical discrete objects. Discrete mechanical <laughs> objects. Yeah, yeah. And what we're trying to get the teachers to do is to recognize through this four-part processing model is that the goal is to get these processing systems to communicate and that uh, a completely formed word image, if you will, um, includes the meaning, the sounds, the print, and the relationship between how this word is used in context and whatever uh, dictionary definitions we have in, in our minds. So we need to get the teachers to recognize in all phases of the lesson that these processing systems need to be connected. So if they're doing a vocabulary lesson, and that's where this came up, it, they, the teacher was supposed to be working on vocabulary, and she discovered that the kids were not differentiating gasp and grasp as she was trying to get them to get the meanings out of the context of the story. And the kids were, were, um, were exchanging pronunciations. One so the, the content was designed to actually uh, backlight or create an opportunity to get the meaning of these words. Yes. For some reason, they weren't reading them with sufficient distinction to have yes. a reference to hang where the context was pointing about the meaning of the word. 
Yes, that's right. They were not reading these words with sufficient differentiation in their own minds of the, the features of the words, the, the symbolic features and the phonological features of the word. So that was related to their uh, confusion of the words and their very fuzzy ideas. They had no grounds to, 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 to hook the meaning to when they encountered the meaning. Right. Meanings, right. The meaning is suggestive, even though they couldn't, but because they couldn't recognize the word as something distinct, they, again, they've got no place to go. That's right. Yeah. In, in order to build a vocabulary, one has to have uh, a, a, an image of the an internal image of the word that allows one to differentiate it from other similar that that is stable and that's a reference point. That's right. So if it floats, <laughs> or if it's in a big mishmash with other words that sound sort of the same or that start with the letter G, um, it's not going to work. And that's why, I mean, so uh, obvious to me, but I don't understand how educators can persist with methods of word recognition instruction that point a child to the first sound of a word and then ask the child to use the context of the sentence to get the identity of the word. It is so misconceived and so contrary to what is required of the child. That would be different. That would be the attempt to uh, fill in for a, a lack of code processing at the um, uh, phonological level mm. and orthographic level by saying, I recognize the meaning of this before I recognize the word. Yes. Right? That's so right. So I'm going to let, let the recognition of the meaning of the word and the, its takeoff sound lock the word down. That's yes. what the conversation was in effect. <laughs> that I was referring to once before, yes. right? that kind of an approach. Yes, yes, yeah, what they are asking a child to do is, yeah, get the meaning of the word first and then try to find and an order. Stick, stick, it, stick it in the word. Yes, right? <laughs> stick it in the word. Right, because if, right. the, if they get the meaning, they can think of, all right, well, I kind of get that meaning, and it starts with this, so what word do I know that means that starts with this? Bang, that must be what it is. Yes. Right? But this, is, this is one of the problems that where I understand what you're doing is to try to integrate these things. I mean, these are, yeah. talk about core articulation. One old word that I used to use is co-implication. That all these things have to co-implicate in the learning process in order for them to co-articulate in, in the expression process. There's mm -hmm. the, they are all um, internally related and they all must be synchronized in very uh, time critical ways and the thing doesn't work. Yeah, I, I'm also using the word co-articulation for just the uh, f phonetic uh, reality that when you, when we say the g in get, that's a different um, vocal gesture, right. articulatory gesture from the gr in grass, because we've anticipated the r that comes after the g in grass. And, th and that the g is different also if it's at the end of a word like frog. We don't make exactly the same articulatory gesture each time. So I'm, I'm using it very specifically for the range of articulatory gestures that occur when a phoneme is embedded in, this, in a spoken word. And, um, and the fact that uh, the features of phonemes spread to one another in the co-articulated word and that makes speech sound identity that much more challenging for kids who have fuzzy phonemic concepts in the first place. So one of the reasons for going through the artificial exercise in the beginning of reading instruction of getting the kids to articulate each phoneme separately and associate a gesture or an object or, or a picture with each phoneme as artificial as that is, is that it gives them a basis for coding the identity of that phoneme even though the identity changes in, in the co-articulated word. It's the basis for uh, phoneme segmentation, phoneme it's identity. The table of elements, the atomistic uh, yeah. molecular uh, bottom out yeah. of which the rest is, is uh, constructed in a sense. Yeah, I, I really like that analogy of the table of elements. Um, who would think of teaching chemistry without beginning with the table of elements? That's absolutely right. Or who would think of teaching um, surgery without anatomy? Who would, no, well, this is what we're doing. 
Yeah, the, the, the analogy that, that uh, we're developing, and that maybe you'd have some hit on and might think is appropriate um, in your work, is, is a player piano. That yeah. the piano has to have a number of keys. <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the, the piano has got to be able to have those things pressed, <laughs> you know, independently at certain rates. If it takes too long for the piano to function when you click this and the sound doesn't come, I mean, it's got a clear, distinct channels that can all operate at a certain frequency rate. Mm -hmm. In order for the uh, player piano script to come along and make music out of those, those fundamental elements. And so if there isn't enough keys, or if the keys can't be played in conjunction at a certain minimum threshold of speed, then no matter what's going on in the player role, the piano's not going to sound right. right. There's a number of technologies to this problem. I mean, the way a CD-ROM works, or a tape player works, or there's all kinds of analogies, it seems to me, between the problems that we're discussing when we talk about reading relative, at least to the orthographic phonological mm -hmm. Well, let's back up a bit. This is great. Three minutes. Let's change tapes then. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I understand um, the angst towards the, the teacher colleges, the people that are training teachers to not be more interested in learning their way into the essence of this problem. Um, I, I mean, this is a, the transmission of ignorance that goes back hundreds of years. This mm -hmm. is nothing new. It's just that our circumstances of our society are pressuring this thing up in a new way. Mm -hmm. But the, the ignorance and the negligence has to do with um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a hundreds it's hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. Tumbling through time. Yeah. You know, and, and a few attempts that anybody's ever done to try to tackle with it have been squashed or smashed or otherwise ridiculed. So that mm -hmm. um, the 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 kind of thinking that goes into this, except for the work of people like yourself, but generally, is gosh, I did it. They can do it. Everybody yeah. can do it. What's the big <laughs> deal? What's the problem here? You know? Yeah. Rolling again. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> again, all these things have to operate together, like we've been saying. Mm -hmm. But we do make a, a distinction. We do make a series of distinctions about these sub processes. There's, you know, the phonemic awareness piece, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of confusion out there when I when we talk to people. Um, there's a sense that, and I just got an email last night from a very, very smart person in this world, in this business, saying, well, um, there's a sense that, uh, that phonemic awareness is this natural thing that kids might not have enough of. Some kids don't come mm. with enough phonemic awareness. <laughs> you know, we're going to help them get more phonemic awareness. Uh-huh. As if it was some, you know, uh, natural quality of a healthy, normal human being, mm -hmm. rather than a um, something that's acquired in relation to learning to read and the kind of artificial distinctions in sound that go with it. Well, learning to read an alphabetic orthography is a very artificial and unnatural act. Um, and all one has to do is look at how long it took people to invent alphabetic writing systems, how recent they are, how many people in the world don't engage in this behavior, have never uh, recapitulated that discovery even though they have oral language systems. Um, I think that it's obvious once one starts to look at the history of writing and um, the universal challenge that this is presented. Uh, it's more, we should, we should be, um, we should be, what's the word I'm looking for? We should be astonished that so many people do learn to read an alphabetic writing system with relatively inexpert instruction. That's what's remarkable. 
Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> Hold on a second. I noticed that you're kind of listing off okay. to one side I'm as, if, as if to get around this corner. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah, right. And I, and I was worried about that. I, was about, okay. I, I didn't okay. want to interrupt right there. All right. Well, so if there's anything in those last few moments okay. that you'd like to repeat, either. okay, I have okay, a... I'll repeat that. I won't list. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I'll move over if, as much as I can. Right. Am I okay with the camera now? That's fine. I'll just remember. If there's anything that's truly remarkable, it's how many people have learned how to read in the last few thousand years with relatively little instruction and relatively inexpert instruction. That's, that's the wondrous achievement. Yeah, I'm in awe of that. When, mm -hmm. I, when, we, when I look at what's involved and how many milliseconds it would, uh -huh. and it's relation to any other task that a human being ever did evolutionarily, yeah. Yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And so you look back in time, whether you call it Moses or whoever you want to hang the invention of the alphabet upon, mm -hmm. there's uh, lots of theories mm -hmm. about that. Um, the, 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 the invention of the alphabet is the first real act of phonemic awareness as we might understand it. Yes. It is the grand yes. phonemic awareness insight. Yes. It's to invent the alphabet. Yes. Yeah. And is it true that the alphabet was invented about 3500 BC? Is that the yes, figure yes, that's yes. correct? There's a number okay. of theories. That, if you, you ever read kind of Robert Allot's work? No. Right. He wrote something you particularly like, which was the articulatory theory of the alphabet, that the alphabet originally um, was a, a side lateral view of the articulation of making certain sounds so that mm -hmm. somebody could transcribe a, a sound system that they didn't even understand. So that stenographers could, could record the exchanges among people, even if they didn't understand the language, by making these little notes for what kind of mouth movements were going on. It, was, mm -hmm. it goes from that to, it was done by priests to um, primarily um, traders in the bazaars of mm -hmm. uh, the Phoenicians. But the oldest known alphabet is the Proto-Canaanite uh, alphabet that dates to about 3500 BC in the copper mines mm -hmm. in, uh, in a tribe that lived there that happens to be, I think this is kind of interesting, happens to be the same tribe that the Bible refers to Moses going to after Egypt at the point that he gets the Ten Commandments. So that mm -hmm. the, the linguistic ar uh, archaeologists would arrive at the same place in the scheme of things by name of tribe and general geography as where the uh, Bible pins the beginning of the first use as we understand it of alphabetic writing. Um, it's pretty interesting. I don't mm. go there too much, but it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but that alphabet is different. The Semitic language system and, and the original Semitic alphabet had a one-to-one -one relationship between the sounds and the letters. Mm -hmm. And when the mm -hmm. Greeks took it on, they go, wait a minute, doesn't make enough sounds, it doesn't make them right, and so they added the vowels and they did things until such time as there was a pretty good correspondence between the letters and the sounds. Mm -hmm. So this is Gatling gun, this is pitching machine, next letter up, fire the sound, cues it off, code cued speech, not internal, mm -hmm. no assembly required, not mm -hmm. at all like we do today. Mm -hmm. It's not until the emergence of English in the 1500s um, that we have the problem begin to emerge that we're faced with today in terms of the complexity of the assembly challenge that the human brain has to go through in order to mm -hmm. convert this ambiguous code. Mm -hmm. Not ambiguous as Vineski and, and others might point to as adults looking down on high with uh, the computer pattern analyzers, but from the point of view of a child coming up into it um, and the kinds of confusions that you're referring to, um, the level of ambiguity is staggering, mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and 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 we're standing out, you know, running them through these obstacle courses offline rather than meeting them in the flow yes. of their challenge and helping them yeah. with it in a way that provokes the insights you're describing, and helps them graduate through the steps to proficiency. That's it. We don't meet them where the challenge really lies. Yeah. That's the tragedy of it. I can go on about this all day, but... Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right. So we dealt with phonemic awareness. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to touch on is the, the relationship about the speed of processing. Hmm? I mean, mm -hmm. if we've got to have the, the phonem phonemic awareness kind of backdrop in order to be slicing and dicing at the right unit level 
-hmm. that can later be assembled when mm -hmm. we play it back during mm -hmm. the, the reading, articulation, uh, uh, writing, spelling process, the code processing downstream. It's got to sit on top of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then this next process has to come, and in a way, if we don't teach them all of the analytical skills that you're talking about, they're in this confusing bog about how to deal with all of this. Mm -hmm. And their brains might be operating so fast, and they may have such a great language inheritance system that they get by it to some degree, the, mm -hmm. the, those percentages that you talk about that do. But for anybody who's weak on any of the foundational skills, when they bump into the confusions that are in the code, if they're not met right, the time it takes them to think it through is way beyond the time that's allotted to construct this reading stream experience before the, the brain's just stuttering too much to have any interest or capacity for it. That's right. Um, even if we teach awareness of phonology and phoneme grapheme correspondence as well, the, the hard part is getting kids to get up to speed. Um, teaching them the elements is not that hard once the teacher knows what to do and what those elements are. That's relatively easy. It's getting kids to see patterns and to have a pattern recognizer system for syllable patterns, conventions in print, and for morphology, which I think is the great untapped um, need in instruction at the intermediate grades and kids uh, are left with very inadequate strategies for reading multisyllabic words so they stumble their way through them and never appreciate the correspondence between um, the stable spellings of morphemes in print and their meanings so that they can enhance their vocabulary through a self-instructional process. That would be of such advantage to so many children who are never classified as having reading problems, but who never experience the facilitating effect of good instruction at that level. Yeah, I mean, you can't take the approach of a simple um, original alphabet where you next letter, next sound, fire, 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 you just constructed a word. Mm -hmm. There are a number of units that are compacted together, and if you don't recognize the boundary between one unit and the next unit and deal with them separately, this is phonetic. But meaning, I can read this thing, yeah. da, 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 this is not, and yeah. this thing has this sound and this meaning. So it's, again, it comes back to this assembly, and this assembly happened to happen faster than thought. Yes. And anything that slows that process down stresses everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, I see many kids falling apart, falling by the wayside when they get to multisyllabic words because they never get up to speed with um, the recognition of orthographic sequences. And the way reading educators talk about this is chunking and chunking as a strategy to build word recognition proficiency, but that chunking is often uninformed. So, for example, you don't want to say to a child, find the little word and the big word. That's not an effective strategy, but teaching them conventions such as um, knowing uh, that um, there are certain letter sequences that occur more often than others and seeing where the boundaries between syllables are likely to be just because of the, the, just the sequences that occur. That's, that's a very important thing to do, and we, we train kids to do that through um, the syllable assembly and syllable division. And, but it's much more productive to work with morphology when kids can get to that level. I think of children who look at a word like um, aggressive. Okay, there's a multisyllabic word and they don't see the root in there, G-R-E-S-S, -S, and they don't think about the relationship between that root and other words they might know, like regress, and it never occurs to them that that's a prefix root suffix construction with parts that recur in other words, and uh, if they recognize the word at that level, they would recall the word and recognize it much more quickly when they see it again. 
if, so if their attention was trained to be making those kind of awareness distinctions yes. about the units, rather than, right. again, rather than the serial flow, they can't right. do that. And yet we kind of teach them as if they can, We're gonna, through phonics or some, some of these right. programs. This is almost like we're teaching them to have the wrong expectations. It's true. We teach them to have the wrong expectations if we leave them at the level of a phoneme, grapheme, one-to-one -one correspondence or sequential decoding process. The way that I try to get this across to teachers is I, I take a, a non-word, L-E-M-I-D, and I add suffixes to it and I have them read down this list, limitify, limitification, limitation, um, lemidate, et cetera, et cetera. I have about 15 suffixes that I add and I ask them to read that and I say, how did you read those words? And I get people to realize that the suffix was processed instantaneously with the rest of the word and has determined where they put the accent so that if they say lamidify and they put the accent on the second syllable, that they are doing something that's driven by the presence of that suffix that they have done differently when they read lemidation. And they wouldn't put the accent on lem unless they could read by analogy and they've learned that when they see that array on the end of the word, they've taken in that letter sequence at the end of the word, that dictates the pronunciation of the word. So that's the best illustration I can think of to make people conscious of the fact that they can't leave kids with a sound-by-sound -sound decoding strategy and call that you know, a, a complete uh, approach to teaching the code. They have to get to... So reading is context-dependent. It's reading. just context-dependent <laughs> in a different way. I mean, yeah. you can say, I live in Colorado where I enjoy live performances. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that mm -hmm. I switches words down the road. Yeah. Not letters down the road. Yes. Yes. The online processing dictates what phrasing you supply, what emphasis you supply at the syntactic level, and um, it will allow you to read a novel word by analogy to other known words if it has a familiar structure. So if we were to map it out, we could say that, that the sound of the letter is connected to the meaning of the word, which is, can be determined by the sentence that the word is in, yes. as well as by the letters that are next to it, before yes. it or after it. Yes. And you look at all these levels that are circulating that have to co-implicate in the yes. clarity and yes. processing and all have to happen faster than thought that no human ever be, being ever did until a few generations ago. Well, some have done, but never on mass enough for it to be a trait of human beings to do so. Yes. And um, that helps us understand that concept of rapid online complete language processing helps us understand what the task is in reading instruction and how long the instruction should go on, how many years it takes for children to truly become proficient, aware readers. But on the other hand, it's, that's what drives a lot of the misconceptions. It's the realization people have that it is complex and there are multiple levels of language processing involved and it is all integrated and rather instantaneous. Uh, so they then sort of take their pick of which processing system they're going to emphasize in instruction and take this sort of top-down approach that, oh, well, uh, syntax will drive word recognition. Why, why not? Doesn't that make as much sense as a bottom-up theory of assembly of the elements into a differentiated image of the word? We need a, a more coherent, integrous system that actually folds around the differences of each child. Yes, and I, I think um, actually uh, the, the field, yes, we need to take into account and be able to recognize where each child is in this learning process as we retain a conceptualization of what the whole uh, uh, learning process is or should be. And we need to become better at mapping a path through the system and all of its layers so that we educate kids about how it all works 
in a way that is learnable and meaningful and it doesn't give kids misinformation or keep them stuck too long on inappropriate strategies that don't pay off as they become more proficient. All, all of those things, I think, are challenges we, we have yet to meet, especially on a wide scale. Excellent. Connected to this, and we touched on this on the phone, I'm, I'm kind of speeding this up into shorter chunks, and, and, okay. and I want to make you feel comfortable that as we come to our close, mm -hmm. if there's anything in our conversation that you need to feel good about, or if there's something that we didn't cover that you feel is important, we're going to go to that. All right. Okay? So you, you don't need to... Um, you're just going to make little mental notes, set them aside, and we can collect those things as we get to the end so mm -hmm. that you're happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that what you were just saying touches on for me is the apparent lack of, of attention or regard to the below proficient. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to say that NAEP's got it right or that anybody's got it right about whatever that is, mm -hmm. however many kids are there. Mm -hmm. but it does seem that focusing on basic as much as we do, right, there's this kind of sense, well, there's a failure to perceive how critically important learning to read transparently is to cognitive health and worldly success. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's not just that they can read a bottle cap or a comic book or a set of instructions on how to put together a bicycle or something simple that they do only when they have to and only in that it, that they do slowly and so forth. But, but to what, what happens to the mind that develops the kind of differentiations and distinctions and speeds of processing and dimensions of abstraction that we're describing when we describe reading in the way that you're talking about, that's an entirely different kind of interior person than a person that didn't go through that. Yes. And that it seems to me that because literacy is a must, it's not like basketball or soccer or basket weaving or dancing, not to demean them in any way, but reading is a non, -non I mean, you, you can't say that. I don't, I don't, I'm going to pass on reading. Yeah. So everybody, that, everybody must read, and anybody that doesn't read transparently, if their life has been diminished because they were forced to learn to read but can't read well enough. Well, I, I see this on such a widespread basis, and I don't know why people aren't more concerned about it, that the quality of one's interior life is so enriched, could be so enriched by awareness of language and deeper levels of literacy, literacy with reflection, literacy with self-instruction, literacy with appreciation for nuance, uh, literacy with um, uh, enjoyment and love of the vehicle of language for conveying ideas. The person who has a rich inner life often has those qualities and looks to books and what books have to offer because the medium is enjoyable, the medium is friendly, the medium of words is, is interesting and captivating and 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 uh, uh, there, there's a sense of joy. I know I I have that, and I I wish everybody had that. Um, it gives a person a sort of endless vista of of, of thought and ways of of uh, exploring what one one knows and thinks because one has at one's command. Uh, a sort of insight into um, how 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 thoughts are conveyed. I I'm perhaps not too articulate uh, articulate about that as as a philosopher would be, but um, it's certainly true that we that most of the children in our country, my my own daughter, I would have to say, who went through good schools, but who has who finds reading to be a labor and who has never learned to. Uh, an affinity for words that would have come from uh, instruction that helped her appreciate word origin and word relationships and these these very interesting things about spelling, meaning, and sound that um, are so exciting for 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 someone who 
who really loves words, she missed out. And so many of her generation missed out because it was never part of the instructional landscape. Um, so I regret so much and that this is the case for so many kids who could go so much farther and who would be so much more intrinsically motivated to pursue learning with the written word, both uh, as consumers of books and as uh, writers, as of people uh, in, in, in the act of expressing their own thoughts. And they're limited by what they can't do. So the idea of just getting kids to basic, is, it's, so, it's so minimal. It's so, it's so tragically minimal. Exactly. <laughs> You're totally trying to yeah. The emphasis for me is, is that um, reading and writing has to be as transparent as speaking and listening, as effortless, as easy to do, mm -hmm. in order for the benefits of what is written mm -hmm. and your ability to express to go from there into the other dimension. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And there's another dimension in here that we haven't discussed which has to do with how the children feel about being confused. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the biggest, least well understood dimension in all of this is still the affective dimension. Yeah. That, yeah. that, 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 that we are teaching these children in such ways that they are feeling confused frequently, near chronically, and they take the confusion to be an indicator of something wrong with them. Yes. So just as reading itself is a faster than conscious process, so is the emotional circuitry that's running this, this, this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And children are developing a pre-conscious aversion to the feel of confusion. Mm -hmm. And a pre-conscious mm -hmm. aversion to the feel of confusion decapitates learning. Well said. So the learning to read process, in, in my view, is the, is, the, is, the, is the national learning disability. Yes. It is the national learning disability. And it doesn't take very long for kids to experience that kind of decapitation resulting from the anticipation of confusion. They experience it. In kindergarten, they experience it after a few episodes in which they're confused and their confusion was not helped by the feedback they got. Yeah, the feedback's incoherent. The feedback is incoherent or unhelpful. They are left with their confusion. They are left with their intuitive sense that something is not adding up, that what they're being told is not right. It hasn't helped. They are living with conceptual fuzz, they are living internally with lack of clarity about the speech to print relationship and about words and meaning and it is not satisfying and they then have no reason to independently pursue this activity. And they, they actually have, mm -hmm. apart from any reasoning at all, they have a feeling aversion, like they have a feeling aversion to doing anything else that shames them. Yes. Right? They, yes. They don't want to go do other things that, that makes them feel bad or that they feel bad when they do. And that's a powerful force. Yes. Well, none of us gravitate toward activities that leave us with a sense of inadequacy or frustration, and especially if we see no resolution to that feeling. I mean, I'm not any good at golf, but I know that I can employ the pro to help me with my swing. And every time I have a lesson, it's satisfying. Kids cannot count on their teachers for that same uh, relief. And that, that, that's the tragedy of our uh, inadequate teacher preparation and, and uh, the, the lack of appropriate tools for teachers to use in the classroom, that there, there is no relief. I have to say something too. Yeah. The in the feedback that they're getting, it, it's not 
just that it might be incoherent or that it's not meeting them, the actual feedback can be shaming too, yeah. further exasperating yeah. because of the general context that we're all living in about, well, what is wrong with these kids yeah. that can't read? Yeah. I mean, that shaming feedback yeah. is, is only... And it may be Im implicit. It may just be implicit. No one has said anything. It's that, well, you're not in this group anymore. <laughs> or, and then think of what New York City's doing. This retain all the third graders who aren't passing. So we have 21 year olds in but, but in, in a classroom, you can't fool the kids. Uh -huh. They know whether they're doing it or whether they're not. And they uh -huh. knew that it's important and they know who's watching them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And all that adds up to a bunch of shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, what's rolling through my head are all the little things that add up and all the instances I've seen over and over again where I wanted to, to, to jump into the teacher's shoes and give the child the feedback that would clarify. One of the things kids always mix up I'm sorry, is, time out. Okay. Sorry. That mic's running up and down her blouse. You can hear that? No, I can. Oh, so you can't hear it. You want me to put it over here so it's not doing that? Really? Is that better? You got to turn okay? it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. It is. It's I think that, that will be all right. Look all right. Okay. But I, I, love, I love to give specifics. So here's a specific. Kids don't know the difference between girl and grill. They can't, they, they go to spell girl and they spell G-R and then they see uh, G-R and they say grr and they can't get it straight. It's very common, and in our studies of kids who have difficulty, one of the types of errors that recurs, both for reading and spelling, is where to place the R in a word, whether it comes before a vowel or after a vowel. So, of course, um, the reality is, of course, if you're a linguist, you know that in girl, the peak of the syllable is er and the vowel and the R are totally welded together. There is no segmentable unit there. It is one unit. It is the peak of the syllable. Er is the vowel. And so it's complete fiction that there's a vowel letter before the R. How are kids supposed to know that? Well, someone needs to confirm for the children that this is a totally logical confusion because the fact that we place a vowel letter before the R is an arbitrary convention of orthography. Other languages don't even bother with that vowel letter. They just put an R in a word like that. So how is the child to learn to differentiate? Well, um, one way is to tell them that they have to rely on arbitrary orthographic memory strategies to do it because they can't rely on sounding the word out to know. Another thing we can say is that the gr in grill has a slightly different mouth position from the er in girl. When the er in girl is, is the syllable peak, the mouth is slightly more open. So we get the child to look at the difference in mouth formation and look in a mirror and see what their mouth is doing so that, uh, especially for spelling, if they're trying to figure out what to do when they spell the word, that they can uh, feel what their mouth is doing and feel that the er in girl is a little more open, whereas the gr in a blend, as in grill, the mouth really puckers up very tightly for that r sound before a vowel. So there is a very slight uh, phonetic, uh, allophonic variation there that they can maybe get a grip on. They can tune in to help differentiate. This they can tune in to differentiate, but they also get the affirmation from the adult that that differentiation is a real puzzle. And um, it's a very arbitrary exercise in orthography to figure out what's what. That's why we've got to tell the story of the code. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> 23 scribes working for a king who needed to raise some money back home. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty bizarre what, yeah. what's, what's underneath 100 million people yeah. struggling. Well, it would have been much more sensible just to use an R for what we use, I, R, E, R, U, R, A, R, and O, R, to represent for er. You know, that's, that was, that's, that's a terrible thing to afflict on children. It is. It's a criminal <laughs> Okay. Um, 
By the way, um, this is kind of parenthetical, but we'll just do this now because it's popped into me now. Um, one of the things that we think is really necessary, that I'd like to, to ask you to think about, is we want to put together an alliance of the, the heavyweight thinkers and carers in the reading community, people that really care about this, to join together with their organizations, very loosely and informally, and identify the top 15 or 20 things that we can consensualize, we can agree on, right, mm -hmm. are the things that would help children the most. Mm -hmm. right? And then turn that over to the world's best animated movie makers and create a Hollywood success blockbuster animated movie along the Shrek line, mm -hmm. right? Where these things are embedded in very powerful ways mm. and bring together the animation, the storytelling, and the underlying um, part history of the code, part awareness of the confusion, part detoxing any sense of being at fault for it, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I just want to plant that seed and come back to it. But we've got a number of people that have kind of joined the team to just be part of the conversation about that. Uh -huh. I'd certainly like you to do that, too. Okay, I'd love to. Okay. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting. And so the medium of, as far as helping the children, does that mean what we would teach teachers to do? Or what if we no. could be the teachers and directly inform children? Yeah, imagine the kids are on this magical, okay. exciting, interesting, okay. playful, entertaining, musical... Okay. Kid blockbuster movie, and okay. in it, in it, the challenges that the story characters are working okay. out uh -huh. are these things. So what we're uh -huh. going to do is, for a moment, separate what the story is, and it's hard to kind of connect the dots. Uh -huh. We're going to bottoms up and top down it, put aside the story stuff. We've uh -huh. got um, one of the the, the most uh, successful uh, awarded animated movie makers of all time interested in this. Great. Okay. We're, gonna, we're sewing together the spinning stool, so to speak. Uh -huh. We've got uh, um, people like Sharon Darling and uh, Shanahan and some others that are interested in joining the team. Uh -huh. so what we're going to do is just to get this to spin where we identify again, what are the kind of confusions that, like the work that you're doing, what are these confusions? Which of those can we address? And, and, and turn these two systems into working together until we create something that both sides are happy with. That it will be an entertaining, across the top, national success that kids, you know, three year old, four year old, through seven or eight year old are going to. Mm -hmm. Their parents, that they don't necessarily mm -hmm. are very literate, are going to with them. Uh huh. Right? Okay. And uh -huh. that, that it's built on an infrastructure of jewels about what's most important to get across to kids, uh -huh. but it's getting across to them in a different way. Okay. Sounds like fun. Yeah, so. In the way where they're spending $300 million already to go see <laughs> animations, right? Right. The greatest right. education environment outside uh -huh. of our schools. Uh-huh. Sure. We did a little five-minute animation for one of the CD-ROMs. I'm listening again. One of the CD-ROMs that we, we have a grant from the uh, SBIR program from the NICHD to take a lot of the information in letters and do um, interactive CD-ROMs for teachers to reinforce the content in letters. And so we did a five-minute history of the English language with these cartoon characters. I, I should show it to I'd you. I'd love it. I'd love it. Oh, that, that was just a little start we did on this. And I'd love to, uh, love to contribute to that. Good, good. All right, so um, I, I think I'm pretty happy with what we've captured. Um, you remember in our pre-brief conversation about this mm -hmm. interview, um, I've covered all the things that we discussed. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that, that you're picking up that we should cover mm -hmm. that we didn't? Yeah, you spoke some in the previous interviews when you were talking about um, working in Washington and, and, and looking over uh, a lot of the studies you were doing and saying, these kids, they're not going to be able to write to fill out an application. Even mm -hmm. if we get them up to a basic mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of reading level, mm -hmm. they're still not getting some of this functional literacy of going and filling out an application of doing these mm -hmm. things. So besides literacy being 
for enjoyment or enrichment of your life, um, why else are you in this? Hmm. What is your, your oh. and impersonal, but also speaking to the dimensions of how important literacy is to, to the kind of job you can get, which means where you can live, which means yeah. what kind of activities you can do, which means yeah. what kind of health care you can get, yeah. to this kind of broad range that we're seeing popping up in studies everywhere, mm -hmm. health, the prisons, too. Can you mm -hmm. speak um, mm -hmm. on that kind of yeah. broader dimension? You're so amazing, yeah. amazingly so focused in where you're at, but can you... Oh, sure. Speak? I mean... Um, I know I was jumping around a lot yeah. there, but... Well, our... Our platitude, which is worth stating redundantly, is that um, those who are literate can make it in life. Those who are illiterate don't make it in life. And as we saw over and over again in Washington, where we were working with high-risk kids, uh, mostly African-American, mostly poor, I could see the whole drama of the social limitations of, of their lives being um, originating with poor literacy instruction in the early grades and lack of access to proficiency in reading and writing. And I could see all around me the products of the school system, the people who were working in that community without the mastery of language, written language and spoken language that enables access to decent paying jobs, to job promotion, and thereby to choice in um, residence, choice in medical care, choice in um, uh, educational opportunities for their own children, I mean, everything emanates from literacy in the very specific senses that we've been discussing it. Um, so it's the great equalizer. And, it, and, and I, I'm troubled by the um, platitudes about educational opportunity in the United States as if it were sufficient to have kids attend school and press them to achieve at higher levels when the basic fundamental problem is not being addressed of their command of the tools that enable them to achieve academically and thereby gain access to the social and economic mainstream. Yeah. It's, it's almost it's as if part of our society and culture, they don't they don't see this. Yeah, they, they, they only don't. they only see the they only see the people that are kind of fuzzily on the other side of this. Yes, but the people that that never got through the ceiling yes. are are invisible aberrations that are in prison right. or or That's walking it. around the streets, but they're they're not real people in the same yeah. way somehow. Yeah, we're living in neighborhoods where they might never go into. Yes. Boy, was that the case in D.C. There I was, you know, on the one hand, working on the black side of town, all poor schools, often the only white person over there, and then I'd be called up to Congress to testify. And I remember that I'm much more left-leaning than otherwise, so I remember that it was a Republican-dominated committee at the time, and some of these young Republican staffers wanted to go out and have a tour of these schools. So I said, okay, sure, I'll take you around. I could tell these people had never been across the river, let alone in one of these schools. And they were the ones who were writing the standards for No Child Left Behind. You know, they never even been in the schools. They have no idea what, it's, what the culture is like, what the teachers are like, what, what the teachers are up against. And um, boy, I was so glad I took them out there. It was life-changing for them, I'm sure, just to go, just to be there. It was so foreign, they had no idea. Anyway. 
anything that you thought is there something that that that's kind of like this unreleased spring in you that wants to come forth with something that we haven't touched on that you think is important valuable essential to what we're trying to do here let me see um maybe if i could just reiterate something about teachers yeah um Teachers and parents are not the problem here. It is, um, the, the problem is our society's lack of insight into what is involved in acquiring literacy. And universities have to dig much deeper in order to lead on this issue instead of follow kicking and screaming under political pressure to meet these challenges of teacher preparation. They have not done a good job. It's this, it's, and it's not just schools of education. It's the whole network of um, policy makers, administrators within education, their relationships with schools of education and the requirements that are imposed on schools of education by concerned citizens in the business community, in the community of parents and families who want to have their children educated. They are allowing the educational system that prepares teachers to get away with not meeting their public responsibility. And that's what needs to change. When we reconceptualize what it means to become an informed teacher and when we become committed to equipping teachers with the knowledge and tools that enable them to get this job done, we will be socially responsible at that point. Excellent. Okay. I have to say, not that I want to go into the conversation about what to do about it, because yeah. it's tricky stuff. Yeah. But um, it's amazing to me how little attention that we give to the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. ultimately what we're talking about is a, an adaption to an archaic technology mm -hmm. that happened over the past 500 years, 600 years, um, that is multi-levels of ambiguity or confusion. Not, mm -hmm. not that we can't like I said, putting on computer pattern scopes, uh, understand the complex relationships between all these, or not necessarily understand them, almost invent them, mm -hmm. almost come up with explanations. Yeah. Right? But that wasn't the logic that drove it. Right. I mean, unless you, you know, subscribe to uh, the divine intent to create a mind exerciser through these bizarre historical accidents, mm -hmm. um, you're left with bizarre historical accidents. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that we've got hundreds of millions of people, you know, struggling, having their lives all malformed because of a code that's so complex, so densely packed with so many layers of confusion. And there isn't that, I mean, this is the millennium bug on steroids. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. I mean, it's big time. Yeah. Lack of attention <laughs> to what a little bit of code work would do yeah. to, to the future. Yeah. Right. right? And we don't right. go much there. Mm hmm Yeah. What I do we can't do say that? it any better than that. Lack of attention to the code and all that that means. It's appreciating the historical uh, accidents that produced it. Um, enjoying learning about those historical accidents because that is a way of making sense out of what we have um, and um, appreciating the interrelationships among languages historically and at present all of that is part of appreciating and learning the code that we have I always love watching the National Spelling Bee because the strategies that those precocious children use have so much to do with the appreciation of many languages and language history. And they always say, what language did the word come from? How do you pronounce it? What does it mean? And if we taught all children to ask those questions and gave them the knowledge base to answer those questions, we'd